Hi, today we're here for a very special bit refill interview. Uh, I'm here with Douglas Tuman, host of the Monero Talk podcast and also the Monero Topia event. Uh, they just had the first one, I believe, in Miami during the Bitcoin conference. Uh, Douglas, how are you? Good. <laughs> thanks for thanks for having me. Yeah, indeed. Thank you for coming on, um, Douglas. The first uh, question I have for you, basically is why Monero? Why Monero? That, that's what our entire conference was about. And that's pretty much what my entire uh, Monero talk show is about. Um, why Monero? Because Monero, I believe, um, is basically uh, liberty through encryption, liberty through code. Uh, it's a way to, uh, hopefully a way to guarantee our liberty in the digital age. That, that's, that's what I'm banking on with Monero. Uh, that's what got me excited about crypto in the first place. What got me excited about Bitcoin. And uh, when I, uh, you know, first started actually using Bitcoin, I was a BTC maxi. And when I first started actually, you know, using Bitcoin, sending it around, I, I quickly realized what I, what I thought was a fundamental flaw, which is that, Basically, everybody can see your transactions, and you know, for me, that was that was a major turnoff. And as I saw something that um, was crucial to to what crypto needs to be, um, there, you know, we could, we could get into all this more, but basically, I think there is a a need for a true digital cash protocol that you know can't be stopped by any government, can't be corrupted by any corporation, uh, as you know, it's, it's a tool that that society is going to need if you want to continue to li live in a, uh, in a liberated state. Uh, otherwise, you know, I think dystopia is essentially inevitable as we transition into this digital world. So I know, I know that sounds uh, pretty extreme, but that, that's, that's why Monero. And I think Monero has uh, basically does it better than any other crypto, um, trying to, uh, you know, be digital cash. So it's, it's fungible at the protocol level, all its des design decisions are based on, you know, making sure it, it, it basically acts as the best form of digital cash we have today and guaranteeing that it will continue to do so in the future. And, uh, I think it does a good job at, you know, designing towards those goals. I want to take it back uh, to a different topic because I know you like ran for Congress or, or tried to become a senator at some point. Congress, um, yeah. yeah, okay, Congress. Um, can you ex talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. So that was in 2020. Um, that was, you know, once again, really, it was that same, so same, same fundamental thing motivating me, driving me, and it was liberty. Um, so. I, you know, it was kind of right place, right time, saw an opportunity where I'd be able to run and get the backing of the Republican Party. Um, so I wouldn't just be running as some renegade guy who would have no chance in hell. And so I saw an opportunity with being able to do that. Uh, and I felt like I needed to get off the sidelines and try to do something to, uh, to fight for liberty. I was kind of fearful the direction things were headed in. And uh, out of a love for Monero and a fear that Monero was, you know, basically going to going to be attacked by by governments and it was going to become, you know, the scapegoat of the crypto community. And I ultimately believed it would uh, succeed anyway, because that's the purpose of crypto, but that it'd be nice to have, um, you know, people out there fighting for it so that we could kind of get to the inevitable faster. And maybe, uh, you know, if we did it here in the U.S., benefit from it. And that was my motivation. That's why that's why I ran. Um, I didn't talk about crypto all that much during my campaign because for the most part, I was campaigning to, you know, people in the New York Congressional Fourth District who, you know, by and large, didn't really know much about crypto at the time. This is in 2020. Um, even now, I'd say a lot more people know about it. Uh, but it was, uh, you know, certainly a, a back, you know, 
the backbone of my campaign was this 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 fight for liberty. Those that were willing to you know listen to me, I I always eventually arrived at the topic and I explained them. And I you know I, I wouldn't lie, you know, I'm not gonna lie, I got some kind of like you know rolling of the eyes, uh, you know, get that often because I think I think people. Um, I, you know, I don't know about you, we could, you know, you could tell me, you know, what, what, you, what your kind of take is, but I think there aren't a lot of people that really do care about these ideas, privacy and liberty. And I think we're seeing more and more now because it's becoming more real for people. But for the most part, people don't stop and think about these things. And they think that anybody that does care about them is just kind of like crazy la la land, like, you know, conspiracy theorists, like concerned about these things, but they sh really shouldn't be. And so, you know, even when, when I ran, I, I got, unfortunately got a lot of that, but I think, uh, but not so much because, you know, we, we had, we had, it was the beginning of the pandemic too. So people were, you know, experiencing that and, and seeing, you know, the wrath of that and how governments responded. But I think even now, if you were to, you know, if I were to run again today, I would get uh, a lot more feedback in terms of people being excited about uh, protecting our liberty. Yeah, no, I agree completely. Um, I, I think liberty is important, but I, I do kind of see that we're like a fringe group uh, in mainstream society. Uh, do you have any future plans to, to run again at some point? Uh, it's, you know, I, not immediately, you know, it's honestly, if, if the smart, the strategic thing would have been for me to run again, right, right now for the same spot. Um, cause we actually did very well. It was primarily democratic district. I ran as a Republican, but we did better than any recent Republican candidate, uh, that tried to win that congressional seat. And then now, more than ever, the seat has become even more winnable. Uh, well, one, because I don't know if you're familiar with the, the red wave that we're kind of seeing, you know, in the U.S., especially we're seeing backlash, especially here in, in New York State, where there's, you know, but it's mostly Democrat, but the, the Republicans are, are becoming kind of stronger than ever right now because there's a little bit of backlash. Uh, and number two, the, the incumbent, um, the woman that's been there for six years, Kathleen Bryce, announced that she's no longer, you know, she's not running again. So it's actually an open seat. Uh, but to answer your question, I was kind of, you know, uh, it took a lot out of me. Um, more so kind of uh, on an emotional level, dealing with this idea of, you know, uh, being an elected official. I didn't, I didn't get elected, but I kind of experienced it through the campaign. And uh, it's just, it's draining. If you want to really do it, the right way and you want to live up to your ideals and you want to do you know it's a really difficult it's a really difficult kind of thankless job uh and you know i wasn't sure if i if i was you know if i had it in me to, to maybe 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 i'll get called upon again and the, the other really big thing is, is it's just a major sacrifice of privacy of your own personal privacy and here i am you know, a privacy advocate, a lover of Monero for all these reasons. Like my goal is to live off the grid. That's why I'm so excited about Monero, right? Back to the whole Liberty thing. But at the same time, I'm going to fl flush it all away, throw it all away so I could go be an elected official. And I, I was so motivated for Monero that I thought it was worth the sacrifice. And, you know, that's why I did it. But now like to do it again, I don't know. It would, and I'd have to, I'd have to know that it'd really be worth it. That's the other thing too. You know, yeah, I kind of, as I went through the process, uh, I, I learned, you know, more about how government really works on, on the, you know, and it's like, what, what can you really get done uh, when you're, when you're one person among, you know, a lot of others and they're all influenced by, you know, they have their own things that are influencing them. And it's like, it comes a little futile and you just go back, you know what? Maybe just uh, help crypto succeed. You know, that's that's the probably the best bet we have at uh, actually uh, achieving progress. Okay. Yeah. No, I could totally see becoming jaded from uh, going <laughs> through that like firsthand. Right. It's um, very it's very unciphered in crypto to to run for office, right? Because the idea, yeah, yeah. well, that that system's broken. You know, so we're just going to go build crypto over here. I do, I do think though, it would help to create bridges into, into current governments for the purposes of moving things along faster though. I want to also change the subject again. Uh, 
did you see Ragnar's recent article where he was saying that Bitcoiners that use Monero need to kind of make themselves known? Um, I was previously a Bitcoin maximalist like yourself, and now I do see a need for Monero. Um, you kind of jumped ship a little early. Like what what gave you the motivation to to go strictly Monero first when uh, you were a Bitcoin maxi? Uh, like I said, originally, you know, was I started using Bitcoin and I saw it as the, you know, the flaw. And then when I discovered Bitcoin, you know, I was on the search then for something that basically fixed that problem. And I was literally looking at Monero and Zcash didn't even exist yet. I was excited Zcash was coming out. I was excited about that and potentially. And then so I, I discovered Monero and then, you know, I fell in love with it for the fact that it seemed to have solved fungibility. And then also when I just saw the way it was architected, you know, most people don't even get into like B, the BT, even the old school, you know, Bitcoin people that like kind of have some respect for Monero. A lot of them haven't even really kept up with Monero to the point with understanding where its tech is at. Um, but when I fully understood the, the tech and the design, it was like a eureka moment for me. It was like the same eureka moment I had when I, when I got interested in Bitcoin. I was like, this is, ama you know, this is amazing for what it does. And it, to the point where it got me as passionate as I was about Bitcoin, I was now that passionate for Monero. And I literally did like, the, I remember like this moment, I was like taking a shower and I'm like considering both paths, you know? And I'm like, you know, uh, obviously I, I love Bitcoin. I love Monero. And I think it, what, it does what I love about crypto better than Bitcoin. And, you know, I might as well move to that side and fight for it. Cause that's the ultimate ideal. That's the one that I want to win. And I'm like, in worst case scenario, it's just, I probably won't just make, I probably won't make as much money as if I just like, I, I made this calculation in my mind as if I just hold on to Bitcoin. Cause you know, it's going to like it'll financially, but I'm like, but you know, I'm like, would I rather, you know, have, you know, $10 million in Bitcoin or maybe just $1 million in Monero completely untraceable digital currency, you know, that I, that I truly have that nobody could come take away from me. And I was like, you know what, even if it was a hit like that, I'm like, Monero, I'm like, cause that's, that's, you know, that's where the Liberty ultimately is. And that's, that's how I got a, uh, so gung ho about Monero. Yeah. Liberty does have a premium. It, it yeah. really does. So um, I agree with you there also. So you say that Monero does stuff better than Bitcoin like specifically what for, for our Bitcoin centric audience here? Uh, well, first and foremost, privacy. Um, and uh, I, I really look at it in terms of fungibility, right? So everybody talks about Bitcoin being digital gold. Well, gold is fungible. You know, every atom of gold equals every other atom of gold, right? Every, you know, US dollar equals every other US dollar. It doesn't matter where where it came from before it arrived at, at you in a transaction. It has no history attached to it. Uh, Bitcoin, fundamentally, every transaction has a history permanent, permanently attached to it. Now, you could do things to try to sh shake it off, but it has that history, and that history could always be analyzed. And even if you try to change it, you can then analyze you know, the fact that it somebody tried to change the history, right? Um, so... That's, that's the biggest thing. That's the fungibility. Second, I would say is its ability to scale on chain. You know, a lot of like, that's one of the initial, uh, you know, arguments against Monero is that it's, you know, not as scalable as Bitcoin when it's really not the case at all. It's architected to be, you know, to, to scale on chain. Uh, you know, ultimately, yeah, maybe you'll need a layer two, but you'll be able to take Monero a lot further, a lot further than you can take Bitcoin in terms of truly being on chain on the protocol level where everybody's just transacting peer to peer. Monero is built because of dynamic block sizes. Basically, uh, it's, it's built for transactions and it's built for the transaction number to go up. And in fact, as the transaction number goes up, the blocks get larger and transaction fees go down. So like, that's another you know, major difference between uh, Monero and Bitcoin. And then uh, I guess a third, I'd say th there's others as well. Um, a third I'd say is it's a ASIC uh, resistant to ASIC mining. So the, the ASIC of Monero is the CPU. So it's, it's really striving to reach that ideal, Satoshi's ideal of one CPU, one vote. 
which really uh, at the end of the day is, you know, what does that mean? That means a truly permissionless network where anybody anywhere in the world can equally be a part of it, depending on the amount of computing power they have, and they don't need some specialized equipment. And so it makes the network extremely permissionless in terms of who can mine it and who can just be a part of it. And so you could envision a much more decentralized system, uh, which is extremely important because that means a system that can't easily be co-opted by a government or influenced by a corporation in any way. Uh, so those, I would say, are the three biggest differences between uh, Monero and Bitcoin. And then there's other technical things like it's, you know, different... Uh, whatever elliptic curve that it's based on like when it, F- fluffy uh always would always tell me like you know the the best argument for monero when talking to maxis because you always see me like debating with maxis you know he's like if any if nothing more monero is the ultimate hedge to bitcoin uh when you look at when you break it down and look at what monero does and what bitcoin does and how and what their differences are it really is like the ultimate hedge um but yeah, I would say those are the, the three major differences or advantages that Romero has over Bitcoin. I kind of consider there's only two like actual like serious crypto currency projects and that's Bitcoin and Monero, in my personal opinion. So can you talk a little bit more about the mining and why the mining difference uh, with the ASIC resistance rather than embracing ASICs is so important in your mind uh like i said because it's it's really reaching towards that ideal one cpu one vote so it's allowing anybody to to basically mine anywhere uh so you then whereas with bitcoin uh the market is is in in terms of mining tends towards centralization or at least federation where you're going to have a couple of big players that because they have more capital, they have the ability to have a larger advantage over other people, you know, because they could competitively create these this this proprietary equipment, the ASIC, and have an advantage of other people that don't have the resources to build the ASIC. Uh, and because of that, you have kind of this tendency towards centralization in terms of who's mining Bitcoin. Um, the cor- you know, basically comes down to a handful of corporations that are going to do- be doing 98% of all the mining of Bitcoin. Uh, and where that then leads to a problem is you can then start to influence the Bitcoin network through the miners by having influence over them. Because now they're not, it's not just some distributed beast where it's, you know, people mining, you know, Monero on their laptops it's you know miners that are in warehouses that you know that are controlled by a, a handful of corporations so maybe you want you, you know maybe your 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 government is saying hey you know we don't like that you're using uh, fossil fuels to do that mining so we're going to create regulations that say you have to do this and they tell the mining companies they have to do it and the mining companies listen because they want to stay in business because they're a corporation you know, and maybe they, they see advantages in, in making deals with the government because nobody, it, if anything, it just creates more barriers for other companies that want to get into the mining network. These guys are already established. Now they're, you know, uh, negotiating with, with their governments that want to regulate. And it's like, the next thing you know, they're almost for, for regulation, right? And next thing you know, you have the government saying, oh, we want to uh, censor these certain transactions. You know, we want to make sure... Uh, uh, whatever it is, you know, we want to blacklist these wallets, you know, that are on, that are on these, these lists. Um, and, uh, to tell a truly decentralized network to do that would be impossible, but to tell, you know, seven corporations that control 98% of it, that's not too hard to do. And it, they have the incentive probably to just listen to the government and go along with it. So that, that's why I think, um, trying to strive towards a decentralized mining network to the point where it's literally mined by people uh, is extremely important. And I think Monero has proven that it's possible and it continues to evolve in that way. So just like with privacy, it's a never ending battle. It's going to be similar. You know, Monero will constantly try to, uh, you know, maintain that and evolve towards that ideal. Uh, but with random X, it's managed to do it. And then the idea is, you know, eventually ASICs will become commodity, you know, the, the, 
become evolve in such a way where nobody really can have an ASIC anymore. That's that's kind of the direction Bitcoin's going. It's taking the opposite direction. It's saying let ASICs exist, and eventually the technology will trickle down to the rest of society to the point where everybody has an ASIC essentially. Um, but in the meantime, you've empa- you've empowered the group that that has the initial advantage and given them the incentive to not want that to happen. Uh, whereas, whereas Monero is taking, you know, an approach from the bottom up saying let's from day one, try to keep it as decentralized as possible, not allowing, uh, you know, some specialized hardware. Uh, and then eventually, you know, eventually everybody will have an ASIC anyway. Right. So basically like the two biggest, um, complaints about Monero from Bitcoiners is that one, the inflation bug thing, and then two, the uh, hard forks that are regularly scheduled uh, protocol level changes, which may put the monetary ecosystem in danger. Uh, what's your rebuttal to, to both of those arguments? Real high level it would be like, well, there, you know, it's, it's just a different design decision, right? And it comes with its own pros and cons. And Bitcoin took different design decisions that come with their own pros and cons. Um, so, uh, there's this, you know, the, inf- uh, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll talk about each one. So the in inflation bug, um, it's, I mean, my, my, my rebuttal to that is, uh, Bitcoin can also have, have, have a bug, right. Uh, it's had in the past, um, and, uh, you know, it could, it could have, it could happen again and it can happen in a way that, you know, uh, may not instantly be detectable. Basically it's going to have, uh, it would have, a, there's, there's, there's potential for Bitcoin to have catastrophic events where, you know, it's, you know, if there's a, if there's a problem with the protocol, uh, you know, let's say the encryption was broken, right. The basic thing that, 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 uh, Bitcoin runs on to say that that's like, impossible is is not true it is possible so it took time for i mean i remember when i first got into bitcoin i had all this distrust with it right like oh what if you know more than 50 percent of the network gets the mining hash rate can they then do you know double spends and the whole network is going to die no, 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 no. and then with time you realize you're, you're trusting in cryptography and you're trusting in math and you're trusting that the developers implemented it correctly and that if everything uh, goes according to plan, it, sh- it should work. So same exact concepts apply to Monero. It's all built, it's built on all the same basic tech of cryptography and math. Uh, it's just that there's just additional math that makes it even cooler where you can't see the ledger, right? Uh, it still has the same, the same basically blockchain led and ledger tech, but there's additional math that's, you know, additional encryption that's, that's put on top of it. So now you can't even see what's going on under the hood, but through encryption, you can, you know, that, you know, it's all accounted for how, because you're entrusting the encryption and you're trusting that it was implemented correctly, which is the same exact thing you're trusting with Bitcoin. It's just doing it again on another iteration. So uh, once you can get over that, and how do you get over that? It takes time and it takes trust in that it's properly being audited. So obviously the code has been audited and everybody currently thinks it's, it's, it's okay. And then with time, uh, you'll continue to gain more trust in it because there's obviously a very large bounty to anybody who can crack it. Uh, so the longer it lasts, the more trust that will be built up in it, just like with Bitcoin. It just may be a little bit more abstract, but it's the same exact basically leap of faith that you're taking with Bitcoin is what you're taking with Monero. And so if you, you know, uh, that, that's, that's my, my rebuttal to that. Um, my rebuttal to the Monero upgrading. Yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, there's arguments to be made as well as to why that's a positive, you know, uh, it's like Bitcoin, whatever Bitcoin's current, you know, whatever, whatever, its current state is Bitcoin just argues how that's the best thing ever, right? Like, oh, we're, you know, it's, it's really hard to up, like to, to edit Bitcoin. What does that mean? That means it's hard to upgrade Bitcoin. So now all of a sudden we're living in a world where upgrades are bad. Like, no, up, upgrades are good. And like the world is a very dynamic place. And if you're building something that's supposed to be resistant to control from outside influence, you need to make sure that you upgrade in a way where you're always resistant to outside influence. So like 
it's a very dynamic world with real, you know, strong, powerful groups that are trying to take down your tech or influence it or co-opt it and the whole, you know, so to, to say that it's advantageous to have a version of that, that, that won't evolve. Uh, I think it's bad. So Monero, you know, the, the culture of Monero is to evolve because we see it as a continuous battle you know, continuously trying to maintain its privacy, continuously trying to be the most decentralized network through upgrades there. And so that would be my rebuttal to that is that that's actually a good thing. Uh, obviously, you know, it comes with the downside of having to trust that the upgrades work, but you know, that once again, that, that comes with time and audit. And then the, the, uh, the idea is that, that, you know, the thinking is that the upgrades will become less and less, you know, frequent. Uh, as Monero kind of solidifies as true digital cash and becomes this uh, globally adopted protocol that then, you know, is distributed and used enough to the point where you don't have to worry about it being taken over. Um, yeah, that would, I think that's the best argument there. Okay. Cool. And, and cool. I would Thank say you. too, the, the, we're already seeing the upgrades are a lot less often. Most of the, the early consistent upgrades were for the purposes of altering the proof of work of Monero to kick ASICs off, but now that random X has been created, uh, there's really no need to upgrade the protocol for just proof of work purposes. So like that whole upgrade that was done on a regular basis is no, no longer necessary. But that being said, yeah. we're still seeing upgrades every now and then for other purposes. Of Can you explain really quickly, like why random X is unique uh, as opposed to like other ASIC resistant uh, proof of work that people built ASICs for? Yeah, I mean, uh, I always I hate this question because I never do a good job at explaining it. And I, I like I imagine that Howard Chu is watching me as I'm doing it. And I get all nervous because I'm, I'm just not a super good tech guy, but I have good, really good interviews with Howard. and He explains it really well. And basically in, in the simplest form is it's designed so that the most efficient machine that can uh, run the proof of work is one that has all the components of a general CPU. So uh, basically, you know, it has to act, do access, you know, random access memory plus use these other aspects of a computer where, it, you know, to go build your own device to try to compete with it that would do it more efficiently. You're not, you're just not going to, maybe you'll get like a slight efficiency increase, but not to the point where it's then worth it for you to go manufacture all of these, you know, CPU pluses that are a little bit more directed towards, uh, you know, mining random X that might be just a little bit better than a general CPU that economically it, it doesn't make sense to do so on a technical level. Like I said, uh, better off watching Howard Chu and he explains it, but basically the, the CPU is the ASIC of Monero. It's the most efficient it's designed. So that becomes the most efficient way to mine Monero. I interviewed Adam Gibson from join market and, um, one of the things that he said that kind of stuck out to me was that one of the things he's most proud of is that he predicted that Zcash would have an inflation book. And then like, I guess a few months after he made the prediction at a conference, uh, it turned out to be true. I think Zcash waited like a year or something before disclosing it, which was kind of uh, weird to begin with, but um, there's that. And then also, um, John Carvalho from Synonym, uh, I interviewed him too. And recently he tweeted that uh, Bitcoin's like, how difficult it is to change it is like its biggest feature because um, having, you know, drastic changes or uh, I don't know if you've seen the BIP 119 controversy that's going on right now in Bitcoin, but. Yeah, I haven't uh, followed it too deeply, but yeah, I so, saw, yeah. Okay, so yeah, so he's arguing that no, making it harder to change is better. Um, what would you say to those, to those arguments? Yeah. Well, like I said, the harder to change, I don't, I don't think, you know, it's a design decision. Are there are there arguments for it? I think, I think it's a real stretch. I think it's honestly, I think it's bullshit. I mean, like, <laughs> dude, at the same time to say, Oh, it's, it's digital, it's digital gold. Yeah. You know? All right. So you know, what's so great about digital gold is, you know, nobody actually uh, spends their gold. They just, they just store it. So we don't actually even need this thing to work. Like you could just sit on the blockchain and never move. Nobody move your Bitcoin. Like, so I think, you know, every argument just seems to be like, oh, well, 
no, digital gold doesn't change or gold doesn't change. So why should digital gold change? But that's just complete. Like I said, it's completely ignoring gold is different. It's a different animal. Nobody's trying to hack gold, you know, because you, you can't until we figure out like alchemy. Right. So like that, that's what you need to overcome to do it. Uh, in Bitcoin, there's a lot of things that you can work on to try to overcome, to influence it. And so if you're not evolving in some way, you're probably not going to keep up with the attacks on it. And that would be my biggest argument. The first attack we're, we're seeing is Bitcoin's transparent layer, which creates an attack surface uh, that Bitcoin has that Monero doesn't have. Now, if Bitcoin was evolving, it would have added confidential transactions, but it didn't. And like that was like where it really turned and was like, mm, we're going to go down the not evolve at all route, even if it means adding a critical feature. So they've, they've, they've chosen that road. So I see why they have to argue that tooth and nail to the point where they're acting like it's an amazing feature. Like, come on, that's ridiculous. That's there's. Two things that kind of swayed me more to the Monero use case. Uh, one of them was when the Canadian truckers were protesting. I don't know if you remember, they received a bunch of Bitcoin donations, which were seized and then addresses were blacklisted. So they couldn't like use them on the blockchain. So basically they put them on paper wallets and, and I guess the paper wallets were seized by the police or something like that. Um, the, the second thing is Hydra market being taken down and it was like a Bitcoin only dark web market. It was like the largest market. And this just happened recently. Uh, it looks like Bitcoin's use case as being censorship resistant is kind of failing. Like, do, do you have an opinion on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I obviously couldn't, couldn't agree more. I think those were two, you know, these are things that we're saying like, oh, we predict that this is going to happen and we predict it. And now they actually happened. Like, I never thought we would see uh a real world example so quickly and and one that was so blatant as like the canadian trucker thing and this was canada right we're not talking about like oh this happened in like china no this this is in this is in canada on the border of of the u.s you know it's like before covid and all this stuff we used to think it was like this you know uh you know free open society uh, and then to see this happening in Canada and to see that, you know, they defaulted to Bitcoin and then Bitcoin just failed for that use case. It was, yeah, a tremendous eye opener to anybody paying attention. I think that was one of the mo one of the f that's going to be looked back as one of the fundamental moments that pushed people over from Bitcoin into Monero. People that were like, you know, starting to open their eyes. Um, yeah. What was your what was the other uh, the other question? Uh, the abandonment of Bitcoin on the dark web. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's totally indicative of the fact that Bitcoin doesn't work for that use case. It doesn't work for the purposes of digital cash. Uh, you have to be a schmuck to go do it. I mean, the only reason you're going to do it is because of the network effect, right? Um, that is the only reason. But then once it's replaced, it doesn't make sense to keep doing it. Like, once you overcome that, which is what Bit Monero is doing on the dark market, there's absolutely no reason to go and still use Bitcoin for that purpose. The only initial, the only reason why it's taking so long is because of Bitcoin's network effect, right? Like the people traditionally had Bitcoin, they wanted to go spend it uh, on these dark markets, but now the vendors are the ones requesting Monero, you know. So it's they're they're the ones that drive the marketplace. The uh, ransomware yeah. guys too. Yeah. Yeah. So if you, you know, if you want to go, if you're, if you're going to, if you're at the point in your life, you're going on a dark market because you want something that means you're like, you're going through who, right? Like, so if the, if the vendors and saying, well, you have to give us this thing to get what you want, you're going to go get it. You're going to go get the Monero. So that, that, that friction is being overcome the network effect. That's where you're seeing that network effect die there first. Uh, because it just, it makes sense for users to it, you overcome it. It's going to take a little bit longer in the, you know, in the, in the clear world, right? Because there isn't this driving motivating factor for digital cash until there is, you know, until that's like things like unrealized capital gains, you know, I could see that being a, a driving factor, you know, when that hits certain jurisdictions around the world, you know, and then people with their Bitcoin are getting letters in the mail telling them exactly how much they owe in unrealized capital gains. And they're like, whoa. Uh, that that's an eye opener, 
And, you know, <laughs> like, you know, it's, it's going to be events like that. It's going to be these events where people realize why digital cash ha- is very valuable, you know, and why you might want to, why you're going to want to have some. Okay. So like in this world where they're going to come out with CBDCs, if they outlaw Monero and say like, oh, 30 years in prison or whatever for using it, just like you're selling drugs. Um, like where, where do you see Monero in a world where it's outlawed? <laughs> well, like you mean like what, like the U S outlaws it. You're just saying some jurisdiction somewhere or like, what's the scenario here? I mean, like in a world where every country has a CBDC, Okay. They could say and, like, and you know, public like blockchains, like start, all public blockchains are, out. are outlawed. Not just Monero, but like Bitcoin, you know. Oh, Ethereum. you're saying all. Yeah. Like yeah. If, if they just decide like no more public blockchains, you have mm. to use the government one. Well, you know, that that's just the people versus the government at that point. You know, the, obviously I think crypto is going to win. You know, um, I think Monero is going to, you know. Okay. If Monero <laughs> specifically is outlawed. Like yeah, they just Mane- so Mane- Monero private. could there's there's a scenario where Monero becomes a scapegoat, especially among certain jurisdictions. You know, especially for a period of time. That's certainly uh, to people that say that and be like, well, that's a good reason to avoid it. Once again, you're you're not in crypto for the right reasons. So please, thank you, thank you for not joining our team because we don't need you. You're not a freedom fighter. <laughs> like like you're you're saying, you know, oh, like all right, so then go continue. So why'd you even leave fiat, man? Like you should just stay in fiat. All right, it's because you just want to go make money. All right. Cool. I get that. I respect, you know, that people are motivated. They have their motivations and money is a, a very, you know, it's, it's a logical thing to be motivated by, but that's only going to get you so far because at the end of the day, uh, if they're okay with your crypto, then that means your crypto probably doesn't fucking work for what it's supposed to be doing. And, you know, at the end of the day, you're going to, you're going to need, you're going to come back to team Monero because that's, what's going to be standing there when your c- crypto was co-opted. So I would say, to you know to that notion that people should start to think about why they really are in crypto in the first place and what the value proposition of crypto is and then you know maybe decide to 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 not abandon monero but just make it uh make it work overnight like the only thing stopping monero is this belief that monero can be stopped is what i always say right so like like they're they're winning if if you're deciding not to get into monero because you think it could get regulated or banned like that's that's the only threat they have once they do ban it it's not going to stop they can't actually stop it so all they can do is kind of scare you out of it so for people that are like promoting that or perpetuating that rumor, uh, it's just ba- it's bad for crypto and it's just bad for society. And just man up and realize, like, you know, you're 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 helping the other side by not, you know, helping Monero. One of the things that you said earlier that kind of stuck out to me was um, that. Monero is like free speech, right? Like it's speech. And one of the uh, the the guys that made PGP who recently spoke at the Monero Topia conference. Um, he won like an epic court case and like the cypherpunks were super inspired by, you know, him winning that and like proving that encryption, you know, code is speech. Um, Philip Zimmerman can, you talk about. Yeah, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about um, him, like meeting him and, and, and you know, what he yeah. has to say about Monero? Um, yeah, no, it was, it was very awesome that he agreed to do Monerotopia. I spoke to him quite a bit building up to it because we were just, we exchanged phone numbers. The next thing you know, we became kind of like, uh, friends and we were FaceTiming and stuff. He's, he's a, obviously he's a cool, he's an amazing, amazing person. So yeah, he invented PGP, pretty good privacy. And it was basically the, the first encryption tool that regular people had access to on the internet for purposes of encrypting messages and sending them to each other. And uh, governments caught wind of this. uh, And basically he got uh, investigated and essentially accused of uh, exporting, uh, you know, munitions uh, because PGP started popping up outside of the United States and was being used by citizens elsewhere. And so he got accused of, you know, exporting this technology that, you know, that they were considering a munition that you needed, you know, you needed permission from the government to, to tell other people about this technology. Uh, but it was open source. So, of course, other people were finding it was completely, truly open source. So what he did was uh, he, he basically, you know, uh, proved his point 
and others helped them out by printing out like the, 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 the text of the code and they wore it on like t-shirts, I think. And they printed it out in, in like a in book form. And they're like, you know, is this, is this book illegal? You know, are you saying, you know, that, that we can, we can't print out this book. And, uh, you know, basically it, that was, that was when, yeah, it was one of the seminal moments of, of kind of, uh, the, the U S government, you know, agreeing to the fact that, you know, code, you know, code, code is speech, uh, and encryption, encryption is, is speech. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I guess there were other cases and whatnot and there's case law, but that's kind of currently, you know, if you were to ask legal scholars, I believe that's, you know, kind of, kind of where the U S government currently is, you know, it hasn't been tested of late. Uh, maybe you'll get tested with something like Monero. So that's why I wanted him to come talk because it's very analogous to what's going on with Monero right now, right? So if we say, hey, is the US government going to try to ban Monero? Well, they tried to ban PGP and that didn't work. So you would think it would be the same outcome for Monero. It's all, you know, same exact scenario. Uh, and if it's not the same outcome, then we have a, we have a real problem. You know, it's like, uh, then that becomes, you know, do you even want to then live in this country? Uh, or, you know, you, you got to figure out how to change, you know, change it or, or leave at that point. Uh, but that's, that was the uh, Zimmerman story. That's why we had him there. There It was awesome to have him. I would say too, like it was a little actually not surprising because I've already been through this once with other people uh, to learn that he, you know, ha- took some issue with digital cash. Uh, here he is a guy who invented PGP, uh, in the arguments he was making in front of uh, the Senate or Congress at the time where he testified, he basically uh, made arguments for digital cash itself and, and as to why that's important for all these reasons we're talking about, you know, for free and open societies. Uh, and then here, here we are and digital cash exists in the form of Monero. And he's like, yeah, but, you know, uh, this can be used to get around sanctions, you know, um, you know, it could be used for, for bad things. And like, we're like, dude, you're like the, the father of, you know, encryption technology. And here you are like, yes, there's bad things that can, that come with amazing technology, but overall for society. And like, it was just a little bit disappointing to see him not like, fully embrace the the cypherpunk aspect of it uh but i don't know that's you know richard stallman or i don't know if you're familiar with him but i had him on my show as well uh he also i mean here's a guy who's been very public about like oh you know you should he's like a proponent of like physical cash for the you know liberty preserving aspects of it but with monero i had him on my show he was concerned that monero could be used to you know for tax evasion like Yo, yeah, <laughs> that was a hard interview to listen to, man. Like, I, I love Richard Stallman. Like, I, I use Linux and I try to use free and open source software when I can. Dude, but, I was so uh, taken aback. That was a difficult <laughs> interview. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, that's crazy because uh, Phil Zimmerman, he inspired the cypherpunk so much that created crypto, that created yeah. Bitcoin. Um, when you said he testified like was he testifying like against like chow me and ecash or something like when was this like that he was uh against- no it was when when he had these issues and then he he did some senate te- or congressional testimony on uh basically arguing for for pgp and you know why it's why it's essentially free speech you know no but that was like pre-bitcoin though, right Oh, way pre-Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like, was he arguing against like Xiaomi and Ecash or something? No, no. I'm saying even even then he was giving examples as to why encryption is important. And he said in the future, they're going to invent a digital cash and it's going to be based on encryption. And we need to make sure that we allow such technology to... No, he was arguing for Monero in that. Now he was, you know, that's why I was surprised. Like, all right, well, now it happened, man. And it exists and we got it. I mean, he's like, ah, but you know, but I, I will say, you know, he's in, in my talking with him, he's becoming, you know, more and more, cause I keep drilling him on these things. I'm like, dude, like you're, you're like, you're the one that you've opened so many people's eyes to this. And yet, you know, you seem apprehensive for these, these reasons. And he's just, you know, he's a complicated figure. He's a very, very smart. He is obviously extremely intelligent guy. And 
you know, you, you find, I've, I find this with a lot, not, you know, not everybody's so super idealistic and, uh, you know, they, life is complicated. <laughs> People are, yeah. complicated. I got you. Um, okay. One of the other things is lightning network being a layer two to Bitcoin. I know a lot of Monero people, um, are kind of contrarian to the lightning network, um, for various reasons. What, what role do you see the lightning network or even layer twos in general, um, for scaling crypto? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not opposed to this idea. I think at some point it's, it's going to make sense. Uh, but I'm just more interested in the core protocol level and getting that to the point where it's as you know widely used as possible, making the base layer as commonplace as we possibly could. I think that should be the goal. Uh, as long as you know, in Bitcoin, the argument is well, you you know, you risk the decentralization of the network. It'll you know, become harder to to run nodes and da da da. da. And, and and I get I get that, but uh, I'm interested in a protocol that that. Do, gonna get that's gonna do it better than Bitcoin. Bitcoin was already given up on it and saying we're moving over to layer two. Uh, eventually, yeah, I think any any of the protocols that become super mainstream uh, and you know whatever become the digital cash of of, of the world, uh, you're gonna have other layers built on top. Not opposed. I just think it's the priority is getting the, the base layer correct right now, uh, and the second layers will come. And you know, I see issues. I see issues with the Lightning Network that you know I, I think it's it's an abstraction. It's it's not it's not as decentralized and censorship resistant as as the base layer, and I that I think that's a problem. We're getting uh, close to an hour here. Uh, thanks again for accepting the interview. Do you want to let people know like how to follow you, where to find your podcast, and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, so Douglas Tuman on Twitter. Um, and then you, the YouTube show is Monero Talk, so the Monero Talk YouTube channel, and that's where we have our Monero Talk show, and we have the Monero Topia show, and yeah, those are two two main main things I'd say. And then I you say you can check out MoneroTopia.com as well. We're gonna start um, taking that site to the next level. That's that's where we house the event, but we're gonna turn it into something else, something some other kind of you know. Uh, utility for the Monero community. Basically, we want to we want to start uh, focusing on helping to you know build out the Monero uh, circular economy. So if you, if you're interested in those concepts, uh, jump on the Monero Topia Telegram. That's where we're trying to uh, work on that, and then check out MoneroTopia.com. Uh, my last surprise question is: I was going to ask it before, but I forgot it, and now I just remembered it. Uh, what would you say like about the fact that Monero doesn't have like functioning multi sig? and like the ability to do like smart contracts and stuff that like ethereum is doing yeah i mean i i'll say you know that'll, that'll come with time you know multi-sig yeah that's no problem uh smart contracts uh yeah it's, that's gonna that's gonna come with time with second layers with you know it could, we were already seeing, you know, there's, there's like wrapped Monero with other protocols. Uh, we got atomic swaps, so you could easily swap into, you know, other protocols that are better at, you know, smart contracts. I would say I'm, I'm more concerned about Monero being digital cash first and foremost, and making sure it gets that that gets that right. Like that's that's what I would say to that. And those other things are are interesting, and they're inevitable, and they're going to play a major part in our our future economies um but for now let's just get the digital cash right and everything else we could uh you know figure out later well douglas thank you very much for coming on the show and letting me interview you and ask you all these questions um it was super fun to chat with you uh thanks thank you man indeed greatly appreciate it